How many of you guys have seen the Planet Earth original, right? So sick. But anyways, snakes. I used to hate snakes. Indiana Jones, anyone? Um, yeah. I, I think my fear of snakes started out when I was little. I remember being like four years old, and I went to go pick up the snake in my backyard. Turned out it was a rattlesnake. I didn't know that at the time. Went to go pick this thing up, and on my way down, my dad grabs me and screams, pulls me back. And I wasn't scared of snakes because of snakes. I was scared of how scared my dad was of snakes. And from then on, I was scared of snakes for the rest of my life until about a year ago or something like that. I was at my buddy's house who just got a snake, and uh, I was like, oh, I'll pick it up. I'm not scared. I picked a snake up, and it was just like coiling around my arm and stuff. I was like, ah, oh, well, this is chill. I guess I'll just watch TV while holding a snake because that's what you do when you're holding a snake, right? So I'm watching TV. I'm sitting on the couch next to my buddy. I think we're watching like SpongeBob or something stupid. And um, we're sitting there, and I'm just watching TV, right? And all of a sudden, I feel this little tickle right here. And then I look down, and the snake found a pocket and was going inside my shirt. And at that point, I could feel it like down there and stuff. So I just yanked it out, threw it on the couch, didn't touch that thing ever again. But snakes... Where was I going with that? That's right. We have a message to go through today. Hey, guys, let's pray real fast. Bow your heads with me. Lord, thank you so much for what you're doing in this ministry. Thank you so much for each and every single junior hire that's here today, Lord. I just pray that their hearts are open, their minds are open for what you have to speak to them uh, today, Lord. And I just pray that, you, uh, that we just have fun with you today, God, and that we can just get to know you that much more today, Lord. So we just come before you excited and expectant for what you're going to do here today, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Cool, guys. So... How many of you guys were there last Tuesday or the Tuesday before? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So let's, let's picture ourselves there on a Tuesday night, right? All like 150 junior hires. Guys, that's so many junior 150? Good job on inviting your friends, by the way. 150 junior hires. We're all there. Pastor Zach's on stage preaching. And let's just say this weird doctor scientist, we'll call him Dr. Junkenstein. Dr. Junkenstein has a teleporter. And by the click of the button, boom. We all get teleported, all 150 of us, guess where? To the desert. That's right, we got a picture of a desert. Imagine, each and every single one of us, we're all in this desert, and we don't know what to do, we're lost, we're scared, but guess what? Pastor Zach gets in front of all of us, and he says, guys, I know a way out. Follow me, and we'll get moving. And we're like, okay, Pastor Zach, we'll follow you. So we're walking through this desert. My question to you guys today is, how many days do you guys think we could survive? You guys think we could survive one day? One day? You guys, yeah? What about two days? Two days in the desert? Yeah. Okay, let's say, we got, let's say we got food and water. Food and water. Do you guys think we can survive for a week in the desert with food and water? Yeah. Yeah. How many? Yeah. All right, let, let's say we have enough food. So uh, when we're walking, I feel like if I, was, if I was in the back, you know, being the caboose, being the intern, making sure no one falls behind and Zach's leading, I would probably walk up to Zach after that week and probably be like, hey, Pastor Zach, something smells really bad. I can see Zach, you know, big old broad walking, you know. And he'll look at me and say, Josh, we've been walking in the desert for a week. He's like, yeah, my feet hurt, man. He's like, Josh, you're the one that smells. I'll be like, no. Probably just, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then walk to the back and keep on walking. And similar to us walking in the desert, there's a group in the Bible known as the Israelites who are also walking in the desert. But... Before they were walking in the desert, the thing is, they were back in Egypt under the Pharaoh. If you guys know the story in Exodus, they were imprisoned, enslaved by Pharaoh. Then God's like, nah, I don't want to be slave. I don't want them to be slaves anymore. So he's like, signs and wonders, boom, I'm taking it out of slaves. You guys are going to go to the promised land. The promised land was promised to Abraham way, way, way back in the day. And these Israelites were looking forward to this promise. And on the way in the desert, they make a mistake in Numbers 13, 14. That's where you guys look up when you guys get the chance. Numbers 13, 14, they mess up, and they mess up big time. And guess what? They had to wander the desert. They were lost. Not for a week, not for a month, not even for a whole year. They were lost for 40 years in the desert. Can you imagine how bad they'd be smelling then? Ugh, it'd be disgusting. But actually, that's where our story's picking up today in Numbers 21. If you guys have your Bibles at your table, I think each table has a Bible. Go ahead and open up to Numbers 21. Numbers is the fourth book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers 21 is the big number that comes right after 20. And we're going to go to verse 4. Numbers 21, verse 4. I'll let you guys get there. So, 21, 4 starts out, and it says, verse 4, From Mount Hor, or, I think that's how you pronounce that, they set out, they, the Israelites, set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. 
How many of you guys know when you're walking to your own promised land, when you're walking to your own success, you might become impatient, you might become tired, and you might start complaining, right? That's what these Israelites were doing. They started complaining. And what they said was, why have you, they said to Moses and to God, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So in response to that, God says, or God, end up, God ends up sending fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. It, what ends up happening is God, a good father, has to discipline his kids, and that's what, exactly what God's doing with the Israelites. When they complain, when they're speaking against cursing God, he ends up see, uh, sending out these serpents. In other words, snakes. Oh. Sends out these snakes. And not only do they just like start going around, along the Israelites, they start biting the Israelites and infecting them with the disease. I don't know if I was among those Israelites, I'd probably be like, <laughs> look at that silly iguana running from the snakes. And then all of a sudden I look to my left and there's a mob of 100 snakes like in that video, just all attacking the Israelites. And next thing you know, all these Israelites start dying left and right. And so verse 7 continues, it says, And the people came to Moses, and they said, We have sinned, duh, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he might take the serpents from us. I'm going to say that again. They said to Moses, Pray to the Lord that he take the serpents from us. So Moses goes and prays, right? He goes up to God and says, Lord, um, I need your help. Take away these serpents. And God responded to Moses. He said, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. That makes sense, right? right? Make a fiery, like, pole out of Moses ends up doing it. He makes it out of bronze, which is red, symbolic for the color of blood. You guys might get that later. Makes this pole, sets in the desert. Anyone that's been, anyone that's infected ends up living because they looked at that pole. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I remember reading it, so I was like, no, that, why would God do that? They, Israel specifically asked. We go back in that verse. They said, pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Doesn't that make sense if we're in a struggle, if we're in a trial or if there are snakes in our way, the best thing to do is pick them up and move them, right? Or throw them, get them, get, like kick them, get them out of the way. But God ends up doing something completely different. He makes this staff and has the Israelites look at it. Why, why would he do that? And so when I was looking at the verse, I tried to figure it out because God's the type of God that can just look at these snakes and go, psh, 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 all the snakes are gone, you know? And God can totally do that, but he doesn't. And so I had to ask myself, why why would God do that? And when I finally took some time to look at the verse, I think I figured out why, and I, I wanted to share that with you guys. Is the reason why is because God wanted to give the Israelites a choice. It's the same choice that, that God gives the Israelites a thousand years later when they're facing Goliath. When they could either choose to fight Goliath like David did, or hide back in fear and be defeated. The same choice that Zach talked about last week, that Peter, when he was walking on the water, the same choice that Peter had that I had to look at the storm, the waves, the wind, and sink? Or to look at Jesus and to walk upon the water? And it's that, that same choice is what these Israelites have, to look upon these serpents and just get bit, you know, and sit back and wallow about their sadness because they're bit, they're going to die. Or they can choose to look at life. And when I started realizing it, it's that same choice that God gives to us too. That same choice to, that we have to either look at the serpents, the trials, the circumstances in our life, or to look at God, look at life rather than death. It's that choice that we have when, on a Saturday morning, when we, or even a daily morning, when we wake up in the morning, we don't want to get out of bed. The choice to look at that or to look at, you know what, there's something worth living for today. There's something worth standing up and exciting about today. Therefore, I'm going to make that choice to live today to the fullest. Or, or when we're looking on our Instagram and we're comparing ourselves to others, or we're at school and people are say, we're listening to the approval of others, when we have the choice to look at that or the choice to hear what God's saying about us, that we're worthy, that we're loved, that we're sons and daughters. And that, that choice that the Israelites had is the same choice that we have today. And that choice to look at the serpents in our lives, to look at trials, circumstances, things that are only going to bring death, or to look at Jesus. Look at, look at the, the thing that God has brought us to salvation. And that's, that's what I wanted to share with you guys today is, is that, that same choice that we have, that, that you guys have, that I have, that each and every single one of us have. So that's my question for you guys this week and the challenge you guys with, that, with uh, this week is what, what are you guys going to look at? Are you guys going to look at things that are ultimately going to bring death or are you going to look at Jesus, the one that is the true salvation, the one that you can find true satisfaction from? 
So it's, you guys have the choice. So I think it's, it's time that we make it. Let's pray. Jesus,